<laughs> Welcome everybody. Thank you for sticking around for afternoon Sunday sessions because of you know those having to pass through Seattle, it can be a challenge to get out of here. I'm sure heading north is pretty easy. So my talk is free PSD is everywhere. Who am I? Michael Dexter. I've gone by a lot of names. I get called things, some very inspirational, occasionally not so inspirational. But at least two developers have used this acronym for yet another project inspired by Michael Dexter. And for that, I'm grateful. <laughs> I've been doing things in the community for some time. Uh, I, I was very lucky to be sat down at a combination of Ultrix and SunOS in college as a CS student in January of 91. What was unique about January of 91? was about the time that the BSD forked off of the 386 OS. There's or? some of that, but Linux came a few months later in August. So it was a whole different world. We had the HP UX, you had the AIX, you had all the legacy old good old stuff, the BSD versus System 5. And I'm very grateful I just had that brief moment of perspective on it. Because you know, once you see only Linux, you only see that or whatever you're presented with. I did a lot of research back when it was like lots of CD-ROMs you buy in a store. I've got the, the Borders Books mouse pad with Linux branding and all that kind of stuff back when there were bookstores and there were CD-ROMs and all that stuff. Borders uh, was still a thing. Pardon? Borders was still a thing. It was a thing. It was a great company back then. I actually worked on the computer section part-time at one point. So in all my research, I came up with Red Hat GNU Linux in 98. I'll talk a little about that experience. Uh, Portland is a Red Hat town from Torvalds on up, and at one point I worked for Mandrakesoft in Portland. They had a little remote support team there. And I moved on to FreeBSD 4.8 and later, thanks to Jails, which I will definitely touch it on today. Uh, I realized there are things to be done, and a colleague of mine started BSDLV, Latvia, back in 2003. And there is some significant code that is on probably your systems from that, like Mandoc. Like, wow, GROF, the license is wrong, the model is wrong, everything's wrong, why do we keep pushing around this like ancient software? What if we just cut to the macros, drop the bottom half, and most free and open source OSs are using that. I started moving to OpenBSD for certain things. I've been organizing the Portland Linux Unix group since 09. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a, a decade passes quickly, and it's like, 150 speakers, and if you're wondering how you fit that many into that amount of time, there were two meetings a month at one point. There was the advanced topics down at FreeGeek, and it, those were good times. Those were good times. Uh, I've been involved with the Beehive Hypervisor since 2011. I was the first user outside of the company that produced it to say, that was cool, how do I try it? And they're like, here's the napkin notes. I'm like, okay. And the rest is history, I suppose. So if you have questions specifically about that, I, can, I certainly have answers. And I've been providing uh, FreeNAS and ZFS support since 2012. If you have questions there, especially from a user's perspective, I can help out there. And uh, according to Jordan, I am the first person to use ZFS on Windows on real hardware. He was using virtual machines, and the moment you go from virtual to hardware, uh, you encounter a whole new set of issues. But I've been keeping a log here because uh, people have a weird habit, and now it's blinking red. I hope that doesn't mean muted. but. I'm going to hope for that. Um, you're welcome to check that out. So, initiative is everything. I mean, I could be talking about anything here, but it's the initiative that matters and your visceral experiences. So I'll touch on this briefly. It's highly related to everything technical I will talk about. For some in BSD circles, it was the USL lawsuit. You probably heard of the Ber Berkeley lawsuit, the you know, you, you know, systems labs out of AT&T and all that, 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 that. Well, uh, folks were posting recently on Twitter, like, every time I apply, no, every time I renew my security credentials, I have to disclose this stupid lawsuit from decades ago. It's like, it's, it's still with them, and they're hopping up and down mad about six files that were problematic in the end. It's like, oh, okay, well, so they get nervous about all legal issues. It's like, no, we have to be more careful here, here, and here, and then they, they, their, their spidey sense starts twitching. So visceral experiences are important, and also known as passion. Uh, I'll trust you are all in this room at this conference for some amount of passion on some topic. So cool, welcome. Uh, I would argue not a single technology you've heard about this weekend matters if you're not inspired to go try it. 
you can just you know, hear every topic, but if it's not inspiring you, then uh, they're wasting their time telling you and you're wasting your time listening to it because, hey, you know, we all, of course, have on topic and off topic, but you've you got to be inspired to try. So, my success today is inspiring you to think about something, to try something, ideally, and I'm really lucky to get involved and participate further. So, <coughs> this guy is doing pretty well with that, Connor. Did anyone catch Connor's talk an hour or two ago? A few hands, excellent, great. I'm stealing partly from his talk, despite me mentoring him in this. <laughs> so, um, about this inspiration thing, John Paul's talk, did anyone catch that? Uh, it was quite good, 50 years of Unix, it's probably gonna be streamed and very well represented. That's Mad Dog, right? Uh, John Mad Dog Hall, okay, yep. Yeah. Very nice person, and travels the world, and gets people walking up like, do you remember me? Which is understandable. No, it's kind of big, like a tiny. And you gave me this Linux CD that I took to the our lab at the school. And long story short, all American you know labs are running Linux because of that like simple nothing moment. So don't accept any barriers that are put in front of you. Just trust your instincts and you know go with it because you never know what amazing, crazy, cool stuff with. And every big old name in tech was a student. And do I have any BTS students here? Any? Yay! I'm going to, oh, and you're a volunteer. Thank you, great. I will use you repeatedly in this talk if that's okay. Because Steve Jobs was a student in a school studying tech stuff. I think it was more colorful, but you know, Steve Wozniak, he was definitely a student somewhere. You know, learning vacuum computer back then. And another key point, no, it's not all been done. <laughs> the moment you think, like my buddies and I thought in CS101, we sat in this little dark deck lab, like. Every computer book's been written. There's a TCP IP book. There's the whatever, and the internet was just arriving, and the web was just arriving. It's like, it's all been done. And if fast forward, I'm looking at a bookstore trying to make sense of like Java, JavaScript, and the, no one knows what's what. It's like, great. So <laughs> never for a moment think there's not an opportunity somewhere. So please, go move some mountains, because all those famous people look just like you at some point. And uh, it's never too late in life. You know, you can go back to school. You can pick up a PC. You can do whatever. And, this stuff's all now affordable. When we were all students, this stuff was ridiculously expensive, like in, inaccessibly expensive. So in the community, it, uh, some skin thickening is required. You, you'll get personalities of all types. I am not a doctor, but I believe that some amount of Asperger's syndrome is required to do this stuff, to just have the, the attachment to it. I see the hand go up. And, and a bunch of hands go up. And yes, I, uh, if I had more, I'd probably be more of a like lower level programmer, but I'm kind of aware of the stuff and I work with developers, development, like Geek Whisperer. So embrace that, but just be prepared that people with that gift are really good at filtering inward content. They're amazing at it. That's what makes them so good. Not always good at filtering what goes out. So <laughs> they're skills to learn. and. You know, we've all made mistakes. You spend more than like a week in this community and you'll make a mistake in some way or misrepresent a tech or misremember a name of a project and people will take issue with that. So anyway, explore the unexplored territories, go on little mountains and you name it. And I'm, I've been trying to live a few years in the future. And when I sat down to Beehive, no, it wasn't friendly. It was a hypervisor on FreeBSD. And no, it you could say sucked as one perspective. Or you could say it has huge potential. <laughs> I'm like saying, but but this thing is like, you know, totally emulation free. This is great. It's in base. It's properly licensed. Although it doesn't do what I need to do. It's like, not yet. <laughs> anyway. So about the skin thickening, uh, the social quirks I touched on briefly, where there are quirky personalities here. And I'm I'm learning more and more that when you have this like event where there's a just miscommunication and ruffled feathers and all that. There's like this 50-50 chance that one of you is totally right and one of you is totally wrong. And it's not always the one intended by the person initiating it gets wacky and fun. I believe there have been talks on imposter syndrome. Is everyone familiar with that term? Okay, there were talks. Great. Uh, I hope you attended them. Uh, it's a fascinating term that's only come up in the last few years where uh, it's intimidating to like walk the hall of John Mad Dog Hall. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm nobody. Uh, you know, but that, that, that's the the benchmark of wow activity in the community. Well, trust your instincts. Just ignore all that. I know it's hard, but just ignore it. Connor, good work today. Is that your first conference talk? Yeah. Very good work today. Welcome. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Wait, wait. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
So, also, as I, I'm setting a lot of sort of uh, prefacing here, but it's almost over. <coughs> uh, distinguish price from priceless. I learned this uh, living in Latvia for eight years, where for the first time in my life, because it was both convenient-ish and we had reasons, uh, I attended church. And that's like old school. That is, you know, Protestantism where they like remember the fork of the church and da 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 da. And in meeting at least one pastor who's into computing and talking with him and all the high tech stuff and whatever, and then our family pastor, uh, there are those who believe in God and those who believe in church. And it's easy to mistake which is which. And, you know, church, it's, it's shiny. And they have these only shiny, cool brass, goldish looking things. And the, the God folks can draw a square in a forest, and that's their church. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And one of those will outlive all those constructs. Those churches will fall down from the weather and earthquakes and other factors. Or businesses will go bankrupt or change direction or whatever. Or they might catch fire in France. Or catch fire, which is tragic, yes. And recently, Notre Dame, right? Uh, and well, some folks are like putting up all this money for the, the cathedral. Should that go to church efforts around the world with the square and a jungle? I don't know. I'm not one to say. But keep in mind that, that it's like the community is super important. Uh, down at the expo floor, Software Freedom Conservancy has been very good at holding, sticking to their guns that we are a public benefit nonprofit focusing on, on users. Because without them, all this stuff just erodes. Companies can change their mind really quickly. So, FOSDEM, anyone been to FOSDEM? What does it stand for? Uh, free and open source uh, developers meeting in, uh, in uh, yeah. Brussels. Brussels. How, well, how would you describe it? Oh, FOSDEM is awesome. So it's the largest, so what they say, it's the largest um, open source conference in Europe. And I think there is over 8,000 attendees this year, and it's free. And so it's crazy. And um, free, free. You know, people, it's, you sort of have to all over your way through. But lots of great talks. They have a lot of specific um, rooms. Like, so we have the BSD room. And so it's like 100, they could fit 100 people. And you'll have uh, various BSD talks, community and legal, and all these different <coughs> types of rooms. So, it's so awesome. to repeat, pause them is awesome. It's huge. It's free. And Linux Fest Northwest, where this is the 20th anniversary, uh, it's the first Linux Fest to use that term to like say, well, you know, maybe this is a thing. Maybe. Let's, let's risk it and try this. 20 years later, here we are. So, I love Unix. I love Unix. I am out of Hollywood. I, oh, I don't have a picture. I literally like grew up behind an airy camera, a big old 35 millimeter camera, and in a studio that my parents ran on Hollywood Boulevard, you have a Pantages Theater, at Gower, if you know the area. <laughs> and in college, as I mentioned, I sat down at a Unix terminal, and I've been using a Mac, and it's pretty and graphical. I'm like, why, what do you mean I'm out of radio? <coughs> this thing with a photo, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, this is behind the scenes. I grew up behind the camera, which is very different from the actors and actresses all in the motorhome. <laughs> We're the grunts lugging video equipment across the desert, and like, ugh, getting up real early to do whatever. So the moment I saw a Unix shell, it's like, that's the guts. I know this. I know this well. I've rummaged around a film studio all my life to that point. So it instantly clicked. And again, visceral experiences. I am only this weekend realizing just how important that is. So here we are. We're talking about free software, open source software, FOSS, FOSS. There are many names for this stuff. But you know it when you see it, especially if you're in this room. So there are the, most of these debates have died down. But a decade ago, there was a lot of talk about what is truly open source 20 years ago. Uh, OSI is still a thing, the Open Source Initiative, declaring what's free and open source, and Debian did a great job of saying, well, you know, we accept this, and F, the Free Software Foundation said, well, this was clearly free by our Ford Freedom's definition, this other stuff not so free, and that debate rages on because now we have companies trying to hijack certain projects, license all that, and it's like, well, hopefully you know it when you see it. So in all of that, my takeaway is Dexter's Law. Only proprietary software vendors want proprietary software. It's like if you're given a choice as a company of business, and businesses have found now they do tech support, it's like they really don't care. They just want their task to be achieved on budget. So 
uh, yeah, that's, uh, that was a realization several years ago based on just the fact that it's like, wait, uh, there's lots of noise from proprietary software, but if you ask the end user, the one with the money, they, they don't want to pay extra if, if all other factors are equal. And now free software is pretty darn mature, thank you very much. So I think that truly the way to achieve software freedom is just vote with your pocketbook. If you're a university, anyone on, been on a university staff, and they're like, oh, your choices are A, B, and C, uh, hopefully you can get the really desirable one and say, no, we need the source to that. We do, we just have to. And there was a brilliant moment that I was not present for, but uh, at a big Microsoft event, they proudly said, well, we've, we've provided the source code to the Chinese government. And the US government generals and such in the room were like, excuse me? <laughs> wait, wait. So if the Chinese can do it, we would hope that the US Army can get access to the source code for the software they use. So you are in charge. Narrowing in on FreeBSD, uh, our circles focus on permissive licensing. Uh, MIT, ISC, BSD2 clause, BSD3 clause, and, and friends. <sighs> Over the years, I've been observing what works, what doesn't, in my <laughs> humble opinion, and I think it's self-defeating to proprietorize. A lot of companies, the, the router vendors, the storage vendors, took early BSD, you know, time is all relative, but they took it and laughed their way to the bank. And they created various products, some in the Seattle area. And then fast forward, the community is still operating around them, and you're stuck with no SMP, but the community has it, symmetrical multiprocessing. You have no 64-bit, but the community has it. And it's all these innovations that are just passion-driven from individuals or other vendors who kind of more get it. And you, know, you can hold on to that ball, but then you're stuck with that ball and maybe the other you know, teammates have all kind of moved on. They're like, well, we share everything out here. So uh, there have been some very good talks over the years, especially BSD can, about vendors who have spent you know, their, their very concerted efforts to catch up with the community. Bless their hearts. That's great. But I don't know. I guess it made sense back at the time, like, oh, we know better than the community. And then, oh, we're kind of stuck hanging. So I've called it the proprietorization curse. It's really tempting to do, but in practice, wow, you break it, you bought it, and you've got recursively more maintenance to do on such a thing. So, further narrowing in, obviously, the GNU Linux and BSD conference, where it's Unix that is not only Unix-y, but it's under an open source license, which when I started this, there was, even Minix begat Linux because he wasn't accepting patches and maybe the license was proprietary. It's like, licenses really matter. All these factors matter. If you're missing them, you don't get, like we mentioned before the thing started, a smartphone based on the convergence of um, thin screens, great batteries, GPS, computing power, and all those things coming together. So we're actually at a great spot in history of, of just open source Unix clones, <laughs> if you will. And so we've got lots of third-party software, we've got application stacks, we've got web servers, we've got all this great stuff for programming languages, and a lot of that, thanks to the internet and cloud, a lot of that innovation starts in open source because you know the classic vendors probably wouldn't produce Go, they probably wouldn't produce a lot of things. So we're at a good time. And back to that point where I discovered Red Hat 5.2. It's like, great, this scrappy little Unix clone. It's quick and simple, it's elegant, it was all packaged up, which is a discussion in FreeBSD of like packaging base. Here's the kernel package, here's the basic utilities. Like, this makes perfect sense, great, yes. A simple, ugly window manager with just great little square windows that you can dress up on your own afterwards. Like, That's great. And the Etsy directory, ls, Etsy. It's all in one terminal page. <laughs> it's like, I can see what I need, because I didn't have like big fancy scrolling and whatever. So it's like, that's great. But out came Red Hat 6. Oh, and it went from a great Unix clone to amazingly crappy, in my opinion, Windows clone with GNOME beta dot something. Yes, sir. Uh, before, before Linux, was your BSD experience on non x86? Absolutely, and that's a very good point. Uh, it was old Sun OS machines, uh, Deck Ultrix on yeah. Motorola, maybe? Deck 2000 or whatever Deck Station was. And John Hall, of course, from DEC, is like doing his thing, great talk. I was on the student committee to choose a DEC Alpha 64-bit back in like 93. It's like, the future's here. 
and then it wasn't here for a long time. <laughs> and now it's on your phone. <laughs> so they were like, we got any joke, the, the year of the Linux desktop. Well, okay, this GNOME I think beta or so early that it just kind of worked and stuff. RPM hell continued where you install some promising stack that has lots of dependencies. You cannot remove it. It you need to fresh install and was miraculously clever, but it was rough. And that Etsy directory suddenly was multiple pages of stuff. And in, subdirectories. James. And subdirectories. There you go. Oh. So further focusing. What is BSD? Well, it's Unix. It started. And again, John's talk, talk was great about this. Uh, back from AT and T, it took a long journey through a bunch of little kind of like a like a, a river delta into different sort of points in time, because this is not an ending point. This is just where we're at, and they'll continue to flow into amazing places. The winning TCP IP stack, there were many, but the BSD one won out, and it arguably gave us the internet possibly years ahead of we would have received it otherwise. Uh, licensing and collaboration. The licensing cleanup after the lawsuit apparently was one of the very first collaborative international efforts over the internet. We now do that all the time. It's like, oh, Microsoft GitHub, yay. That was not yet a thing to just talk, work with people around the world and compare your work. You sat in a little room up in front of the terminals that are all hardwired, and that's just how it worked. So that grew up. Uh, innovations like Chroot, that was at and but it was quickly adopted by BSD Jail, which I'll talk about briefly. Hypervisor, containment, which is a hot topic now, but it was a hot topic in Primordial way back when. BSDs as general purpose OSs, earlier I had a question about it. OpenBSD, uh, different focus, focus on security, almost conservatism, pretty good cross-platform support. Uh, some call to research, some OS, some use it every single day for like, posting things. So I've used a lot of OpenBSD server side. FreeBSD, extremely general purpose in all wonderful ways. Uh, NetBSD, which Bit of a niche OS, but with a lot of good things going for it. It's now getting ZFS. It's now getting its own hypervisor. <coughs> Didn't adopt Beehive, but that's okay. Let's have this like amazing catalog of wonderful things to use. The fast file system. Out of the, thank you, Dr. Kirk McCusick. Yeah. The de facto reference of how file systems are done in the modern world came out of there, and everything else is a copy of it. But then Sun, with its own Solaris, come open Solaris, eventually did ZFS and rethought everything. And that's a, some, an item I'll talk about. And I consider these primary technologies. So really narrowing in, uh, uh, too long, didn't read. Control T, SIG info. Who knows what that is and who does not know what that is? Uh, doesn't know what that is? I don't remember what that is. Okay. It's the uh, biggest feature that Linux misses, I think. I use it all the time. To quote this gentleman, a big feature that Linux misses. So here we go. I am DDing an image for the laptop at the the FreeBSD table down there. And so I've got this mem stick that I'm just aiming at a device, and I hit Control T, and it SIG infos it, and says, you are this many blocks into the task. And granted, it's not like human readable, but I realize the 14 is a lot closer to the actual size of, do, 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 do. Uh, too, too close, but uh, here we go. It's 147. Yeah, the 147, what? Ah. 147. So, it's like, oh, I'm almost done. That's all I want to know. Just one simple piece of information. And some utilities have a lot more information. Some have just zero or what they're stuck on. So for debugging, you name it. Uh, any Linux developers per se here? OK. If you want a gold statue made of yourself out on the lawn or at MIT or wherever, implement SIG info and control T on Linux. They will, this, this person has explained the value of that. But Somehow it's not made it all these years. So it just makes life easier when you're maintaining systems, you name it. So oh, the following FreeBSD tools have helped me move mountains, do really cool stuff. So who's in? Let's do this. FreeBSD jail. This was my relief to RPM help. When I realized that when it's littering user, local user this, user that, or its own opt directory and other stuff all over the place. With jail, you could create a completely separate, smart cheroot that is not simply a cheroot in the tra traditional sense, but it acts as if it's a whole independent system. And you can 
Delete it all with one command. Bye-bye, I'm going to try again. Very useful. Hard disks were small, I realize, and now more and more I realize that the, these, these early constraints are still with us in various ways, but uh, not everyone had you know, all that extra space. So, arguably Docker long before Docker. A lot of that effective result of, like, here's another quick little mini machine, uh, tweak some knobs, make a real minimalist OS, and it does one thing well, and that's real secure, because you know, software that's not there can't be rooted and such. So, good thing. Oh, got packets. Again, the winning TCP IP stack and packet filter. Thank you, OpenBSD, for that contribution. Connor's talk covered this extremely well and allows me to kind of hit high gear and say, you know, a human readable IPv4 and v6 firewall. Apparently, on Linux, you've got your v4 and your, your distant cousin v6, and you kind of maintain here and pop over here and maintain here. So, so yeah, uh, it's, it's a complete rethink. They, the OpenBSD folks said, no, this is broken. We have to start from scratch. Hard stop and start. <laughs> so, PFSense, <laughs> it's running this event. How was the internet at this event? On your phone, on your laptop, you name it. Good enough, I got two thumbs up there. Great, it works, it's a thing. Connor's talk covers it extremely well, and he went into detail on all the features, you name it. So, step one, FreeBSD free is literally every here, it, everywhere, it is you know, running what's going on here. The package management. The old tool was thrown out, and a new one was developed several years ago, and it's all around very good. For the little laptop at the table there, I did package install XFCE, Firefox, LibreOffice, just in case I'd use that one for the talk, and it does what I need to do on a continue with my work. Very happy with that. So this laptop was just a, a little simple installation command. Granted, most distributions of any kind are light years better than they were, but it's also just in general quite good. Platforms. Early on, FreeBSD focused on i386. That was the thing. It's like, let's get it the fastest OS out there, and you get things like fdbcdrom.com just pumping out the majority of the internet. It's a topic we'll get back to in a sec. But Raspberry Pi supported uh, Rock Pro 64, a 64-bit nifty little arm board. The Overdrive 1000, an interesting machine. It might be discontinued, but ARM64 for not a ton of money. And of course, lots of really good i386 and AMD64 support. And in my lab, it is ThinkPads and HPZ workstations. Anyone familiar with the HPZ? Z series, I got one nod. They're built for engineers, like CAD engineers. So they generally have like a fancy video card. They're really well built. No one knows what to make of them, so they're really cheap. <laughs> they are a dream. So I have like, oh, now I've uh, a 10 down from 11. I gave him one. Uh, about 120 bucks on eBay, if you know where to look and what to do. And they're all identical, so I can actually do meaningful testing work. So things like a Xeon processor for very little money. And equally, there are now ARM solutions that are pretending to be like that big Thunder X server for very little money, which enables wonderful things. So in addition to platforms, virtual platforms. I've helped usher in both of these in big and small ways. The Beehive Hypervisor, anyone heard of it for what it's worth? Got some nods, okay. Uh, from day one, completely emulation free. Instead of like, we're emulating BIOS with a floppy drive that no one's checked the security of, and we're gonna work our way up, and it's like, oh, you know, KVM vulnerable from the floppy drive? Who's using a floppy drive on their virtual? <laughs> like, oh, really? <laughs> so, Cut out all the garbage. Rely on modern conventions like VertIO and hardware assistance, VTD, VTX, VTD, and modern processors. It's a good thing. Uh, maybe after the talk, what would you like to know? I'll be around for a little while. I won't deep dive now. I helped get Zen packaged on FreeBSD. It was a thing that the developer was at, you know, working on off hours, but until it's packaged up and available to users, it's virtually inaccessible, even though it's right there. It's like, it's right, I can touch it, I can feel it, I can touch it. The build framework, I've really learned to appreciate this, and thank you Bjorn Z for cleaning up a lot of build options recently, awesome. Uh, let's think jail being like Docker, and the goal being a really tiny dedicated machine. With the kernel configuration file, you can dump all those drivers, and, and bu even buses, and stuff that you will never use in this tiny little simple thing to run a mail server, whatever function. With build options, you can dump 
entire things like, oh, ZFS. If it's a virtual machine that's a tiny lightweight jail that fits in like 20 megs, just cut that out. You don't need that. Uh, Poudrier, it's a French word for powder keg. Uh, for building third-party software, the, the packages, a lot of people are using it in production, need to custom build certain options because your modern web server has pages and pages of con possible configuration, and the pre-built porting person needs to just choose some rational defaults, hopefully. Uh, things like MakeFS allows a user to create a disk image that you drop all this stuff into. So suddenly all these parts are just like, fun. <laughs> I'm going to drop the image into the virtual machine, I'm going to drop a real small OS into the jail and just go to town. Awesome. So, so build, build it in your image, uh, figuratively, literally. So this image and just whatever you want envision. The Geom storage stack. I keep remembering new layers. It's a layerable storage stack where you can add journaling to MS-DOS FS if you really wanted to. You can do all sorts of neat plug and play stuff. And I don't think it gets the attention it really deserves because I'm now using the heck out of CTL to prototype NVMe cards kicking into read-only mode when they reach their end of life, which is terrifying to an OS when you certainly rely on writes. <laughs> so a lot of fun things, and iSCSI and Fiber Channel are used in production 24-7 around the world. So speaking of storage, <laughs> OpenZFS. I mentioned earlier, Sun just like OpenBSD and PF concluded that, OK, we've learned our lessons. Hardware is very different from where we started. We're not dealing with like 12K of RAM or whatever it was back in the day. We now have lots of RAM. We have lots of disk. We have lots of CPU power. Let's jettison all the old ideas and re-implement from scratch. And you know, I'd love to, I wish they had videotaped all those early planning sessions of what it should look like. Because after many years with it, I still think the ZFS model is the way to go. It has its quirks, and if you understand them, but it's like, it's really well thought out, and ZFS uh, FreeBSD has been a first-class ZFS platform for quite some time. So it's an always consistent on-disk state, copy on the right. It's like, OK, I wrote this thing successfully before deleting what it replaces. You don't get the shorn right when you write half of the new stuff, lose power, and oh, you've got nothing new and nothing old. <laughs> you've got garbage. Uh, it's continuously, thanks to modern CPUs, it is checksumming data, writing it to disk, verifying the checksumming, and continuing. You can edit and distribute video with that real time, so modern CPUs allow that magic to happen beautifully. It very efficiently, thanks to the copy on the right model, lets you snapshot your data. Uh, any new information after a snapshot is a delta of the previous information. So it's, it's short of microscopic metadata, it's the diff of what you had. Very efficient. Integrated volume RAID manager, soft RAID effectively. Uh, it's very flexible for distributed RAID, akin to RAID 5 and N6 and onward, and stripes and mirrors for real classic performance uh, in, in what you could represent in other software RAID or hardware RAID real easily. Uh, flash tiering, write logs and read caches. Connor covered it all very well. And Alan Jude will give a talk, I believe, in the next session about ZFS. So you'll get a lot of this in more depth there. Boot environments, where, which are an OS system, like a jail, where a separate root of this OS is choosable at boot. I can run FreeBSD 10. I can run 12. I can run 13 and have them overlap or be isolated as much as I want. That is such a godsend, thinking back to RPM Hell. And uh, it's cross-platform. There are alternatives, but they run on one OS if you're lucky, <laughs> maybe two, two if you're lucky. And a very strong community with uh, annual developer summits and active, oh, Slack, you name it. So uh, who's heard of ransomware, CryptoLocker? Here's the killer app. <laughs> that snapshotting is at the block level. So users and attackers and whoever else and the cat on the keyboard can do whatever you want at the top level. But if you're snapshotting continuously, you can bring it right back to where you were with the users, the attackers, and the cat, never knowing that you did that. It's just like suddenly you're back where you were. It's like, wait, their, their data reappeared. Yep, it did. So I've got a few articles out there on CryptoLocker. Just look up FreeNAS CryptoLocker and uh, all based on an offhand conversation with a client where it's like, 
uh, have you heard of this thing? Like, yeah. And then he explained how he's just saving businesses. Like, wait, they'd be out of business if we didn't get them back. Boom. So Freenas does that very well, delivers it well. So boom, Freenas. Uh, the most popular software-defined storage OS. At 10 million downloads, it does trounce uh, many of the proprietary ones or the free alternatives. It's been kind of in the lead there for years. So it'll stay there. Let's keep it there. Uh, it brings together the ZFS I mentioned, the high performance networking, the things like iSCSI and Fiber Channel even, and naturally your traditional sharing like Samba and AFP and FTP and WebDAV. And when people like Lumber counters or CPU developers with their wafers, with a photo of the wafer, are dumping in those photos at high speed, things like WebDAV, a really simple, stupid protocol, are really attractive because they're really fast. So the sheer flexibility is great. And so again, FreeNAS makes OpenZF easy. It's got all these nifty features. And it does things like, hey, you know, you're filling your pool, morning, warning which will save you a lot of simple, avoidable downtime. And other cool things, hey, a disk has died. Uh, we've all probably had technology die without knowing it until too late. So briefly back to software freedom. It's a hot topic, it's close to my heart. Now, FreeNAS is primarily permissively licensed, BSD licensed. You could, no, you could, people do produce proprietary versions of it. They do products based on FreeNAS, which they're fully allowed to do. FreeNAS competes in a sea of GNU Linux-based storage products. I would argue the majority of those are not providing any notion of source to go with that delivered product in violation of the GPL. So they're succeeding better at GPL compliance despite zero obligation to do so. So that's a fascinating one. Bradley down at the Conservancy booth can also elaborate on you know, what vendors are doing right, what they're doing wrong how they help to get them through this process, because it's, it's complicated. And do you say, you know, did I hear petabyte? I'm not finding online a lot of mentions of, say, ButterFS-based petabytes or, or XFS-based petabytes. What would that look like? A lot of hardware raid? Alan Jude, if you catch his talk, is like, as his business grows, what would he use? It's not clear. It's just not obvious what could scale the way this scales. And I can talk in the hallway about what under the hood lets it scale. There's massive use of it by MSPs, managed services providers. When the client said, we are the largest Veeam client on the planet, because they have all these data centers filled with things like FreeNAS, not exclusively, they diversified, but they as an organization are the largest user of this backup software. The end user never knows that. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care. They just want their stuff backed up for a certain fee per month and you name it. So as about FreeBSD is everywhere. It is owning these industries, but you probably don't know about it. Oh, alternatives, I've got a few articles out there. ButterFS, promising. It had some early hiccups. I don't know if they quite have distributed parity right. Uh, SUSE does commit to the Stripe mirroring, but not the distributed parity. There are the proprietary alternatives, Waffle, and Microsoft, be, despite all its budget and brilliance, is not yet having you know, a modern file system on their systems by default. Very strange. Bcache FS was one of the most promising things I found in my research. It's attempting to do a rethink on what was a, a read-write cache you drop on top of an OS and then do their own OS. So check that out. But we need alternatives. We need a diverse ecosystem. I've got a few articles out there on that. So, if you're using ZFS, I just, as a support provider, I want you to get these things right so you don't call me after you got them wrong. I don't like that. Uh, you don't need a RAID card. Uh, even if you put your RAID card in uh, JBOD mode and you have disks individually shared out, you're often hiding the smart data. And just Thursday, I'm like, this drive is running really hot. Is there a dead fan? Is there a dust bunny? Is there something in there? And if you hide that information, you don't have that information. Maintain redundancy. People do make the mistake. and any computer will let you do stupid, no, I won't say stupid, but uninformed things such as this great stripe, it's fast, it's huge, it's amazing, but it has no redundancy in it. Unless you're like real time somehow magically backing it up, it could vanish in an instant. So yeah, very stupid. I'm, I want to be polite. Uh, do not fill your Z pool. Although I'd prefer you fill it with snapshots and work your way back. 
rather than, oh, we have no snapshots, we're full, we didn't delete a few to free it up and get you back in. It's like, oh, we, we were kind of really hurting when we could have just ah, ran out of good disk space in a really good way. <laughs> back it up. <laughs> You know, any NAS system is not a backup in and of itself. So just please back up your data. I know as it's getting into like triple digit terabytes for lower end users, eh, it's getting kind of scary. The options are scary. And then ask as your backup provider that MSP using ZFS at that end, because what if you're going to great precautions and they aren't? Ask them. And scrub validate. That's the system in ZFS that runs through and verifies every checksum. We we're checking the data. Let's make sure that that little particle from space didn't travel through the disk and flip some bits and process. Simple stuff. So, how do you get started? Uh, I believe Connor used the term gateway drugs. Well, FreeNAS and PFSense are a great combo, and it's a wonderful flashback back to like 1995 when the Linux thing with a floppy boot showed up in the office, and users could finally print. <laughs> it's like, this is great. They don't care what made that happen, but they're happy that it happened. So there's a lot of FreeBSD, PFSense, FreeNAS, TrueNAS, TrueOS, a, a graphical desktop based on FreeBSD, hiding in data centers and offices around the world that the end user doesn't see or need to care about. But in a perfect world, they'll all know it really well. They'll donate to the organizations that produce these. But we're, we're getting there. We're going to get in there. And a few resources. Uh, Alan's talk will be hosted by Alan, who's the host, uh, co-host of BSD Now TV, a very good podcast. If you're looking for BSD News, check out their show notes. They have done all the hard work to find the cool stuff going on. <laughs> I love that. A free BSD journal from the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, very well thought out, far better than blog post materials, like, like, like <laughs> mature, <laughs> uh, vetted good stuff. And I verified at the booth down below, the BSD certification group handed over the certification project to LPI. Hopefully within the next six or so months, they will de redeploy BSD certification under the LPI infrastructure. So I have zero insights into how they're keeping that up to date, but that's a good mm -hmm. thing. Certification has its place, I will admit. It would be excellent if they could offer an exam at next year's Linux Fest. Yes, and there was a point there that they were very diligently giving exams from Levine, of boom, boom, organizing them, and yes, but hope maybe drop that at their booth down there, just as a user. Would you take that exam? Yeah, I would. Right. I'd probably have to bone up a little bit. There's some obscure things. You know, I can't remember the last time I set a user quota. You know, I, there you go. Yeah. Under UFS or ZFS? Yeah. Well, okay. ZFS, <laughs> ZFS, I'd have better luck. Okay, least, cool. Yeah, I, I think yeah. I know it better there. But, Sweet. Yeah. Thank you for the, to the FreeBSD Foundation. We do have a representative here to help bring a bunch of us Northwesterners get to this event. It's local, but when it's a six-hour drive, it's not so local. We aren't sleeping in our own beds, so thank you very much. And Deb was here. Thank you for that. How am I on time? Because thank you. Any questions? I have just one thing I'd like to add to one of those. Verify your backup, because a backup is not a what it sounds like. It should be restores are valuable. Very good point. And for the stream, or at least the recording, <coughs> verify your backups. And granted, a ZFS array that's equal to the source, or a larger, lower, low and slow, big old uh, cold storage, is online. So if you're wondering if uh, a file is out there, you, hop, you log into that system and go look into perhaps even a mounted snapshot and say, oh, yes, we have the six month old version of that little employee file. When it's a tape and someone comes in and puts a tape on your desk, it's like, oh, really? Do you really? I don't want to go put that somewhere and wipe my current work to get that much data back till I just poke at it and look at one stupid file. So yes, verify your backups and ZFS does that really well. Other questions? I don't know how we are on time, I'm just rolling along. Um, yes. and it's one thing. You, you had said on the ZFS page that you don't need a RAID card. I would stronger say that you don't want a RAID card. I've got, I've got a Dell server that's, that we've combined. It used to be a single RAID volume. We changed it to several JBODs. Yep. I, I still, whenever a drive fails, I have to 
take the system down and go into the raid management. The BIOS and, and, and yeah. Yeah. unassign that. Right. Like that there, are, there are certain there are some that are, yeah. The Eurekas yeah. have a little Ethernet port and like a web server and you can like go in and do cabinet management and stuff. And the high point cards have a thing that'll plug into FreeNAS and give you a web interface on a different port. But why? <laughs> it's like, yeah, and the, the, the number one thing on, on the visceral experience on raid cards is when people have that nifty Dell raid card on, that they bought online with a dead battery or good enough battery that it reports being okay, but it's really in fact like nearly dead and they are using it and they are, it is telling ZFS that everything is written to disk when it is not in fact written to disk and you lose power and boom, your array is goes south because you told me it's on disk, I, you told me. So anyway, thank you all for coming. You can catch me in the hallway.